So, welcome to Grim Dark 101. <laughs> so, uh, Grim Dark Fantasy is a relative uh, new uh, subgenre in fantasy itself. But before we actually get into Grim Dark Fantasy, let's take a look at what typical fantasy is like. So, if we were to look at the um, regular fantasy, we really follow along in the hero's journey. And with the hero's journey, you would have a typical farm boy or girl who has a um, some sort of maybe power or gift, and they're in the ordinary world. Then something happens that propels them to go forward across that threshold out into the unknown world. And that's a call to action. And sometimes <laughs> they actually go with the call to action, but if not, then, you know, simple burning down the village or killing up the parents will propel them forward. <laughs> Yeah. So um, once they're out there into the unknown world, they are then introduced to allies and a mentor. The mentor will therefore uh, help them train, prepare for the following quests and challenges they must face. Now along the way, they're going to face uh, defeat some enemies, and eventually the hero themselves will probably face some sort of defeat, and they may lose their mentor along the way. Now eventually they can learn from that defeat, otherwise the story ends. And then they propel forward uh, with the help of their allies, continue to be more allies, growing stronger, defeating more enemies, growing stronger, and then finally facing the final boss. After they face the final boss, they come home with the treasure, returning change back to the ordinary world. Real dark fantasy doesn't follow that completely. Okay, so what is grim dark fantasy? That's a question that I asked uh, about three years ago when I first entered this program, a little bit less than three, and I proposed it to a, my writer's group, and there's Grim Dark Readers and Writers group, and for everyone that responded, they all had various um, answers. Like, for example, they might say, oh, it's something about blood and guts and gore, or it's about the needless um, existence of defeat, or they'd say, I know it when I see it, you know. The porn definition, but without the happy ending. <laughs> okay, so uh, Grim Dark actually comes from uh, the term comes from a tabletop uh, game from GameStop, uh, 40K, and the term actually is uh, the tagline is the in the grim darkness of the far future there is only war. So. so people took that and they started applying that to this new subgenre. And so when they gave me a whole bunch of books to examine, I read, I think, close to 100 books, just to see. Um, and one of the books they gave me is Eldred. Eldred is basically the anti-Tolkien, because uh, Morcock wanted to go against the moralist of uh, uh, Tolkien there, and he created his own anti-hero. And this anti-hero, basically, I call him the emo elf, because he's really depressed all the time, he's sad. <laughs> And he ends up killing the people he loves and using a sword called Stormbringer that basically drinks their soul and feeds them like heroin. Okay. okay? Guess what? It's not grim dark. No. Nope. It's just <laughs> then <laughs> we have uh, Thomas Covenant, the unbeliever. Here you have a guy whose life is literally falling apart because he's got leprosy. He is therefore transported into the fantasy world uh, where he, when he gets there, he doesn't believe that he, he thinks he's dreaming. So as a result, the first person he comes across, a young girl, he actually violates. Not grim dark. And we're all very familiar with the, you know, that HBO show that will never be finished in writing, I guess. <laughs> yeah. You know, one with thrones and dragons and, you know, a, a dwarf that does patricide. <laughs> Also, not grim. Dark. Okay. All right. So, what are the aspects of grim dark? Here we go. What I was reading, this is what I found. There are seven aspects to grim dark itself. So, um, there's the world at war. Now, when we're looking at the world at war itself, uh, we're talking about it could be a continent, it could be a city, it could even come down to even factions within the city. Now, the stories have to start out at war. It could be something where war is on the verge. It's getting close by, but there has to be war. Because as we can see here, it's in the tagline. Of course, when there's war, there's heightened violence. 
Now, in typical fantasy, especially older fantasy, you would talk about you know people dying, but it wouldn't be very graphic. And uh, Grim Dark Fantasy is extremely graphic. You actually hear us uh, read about the you know the blood, the guts, everything. It's really nasty, and uh, so that really helps to exemplify parts of the world at war. And as a result, uh, we have amoral characters who are in that war uh, world. Um, basically, when it's an amoral character, it's basically it's someone who is not out there to serve the world for themselves. I mean, for, to serve the world for the a purpose of serving the world. They're doing things for mostly for themselves. So basically, um, to say if I want to save Mickey, I could sacrifice half the room here to save him. That means I'm being, you know, making the choice. So amoral character. Um, then we have the anti-pastoral. Now, when you look at the pastoral setting, you're thinking about something like the Shire. It's green, it's gardens, beautiful. Uh, and grim dark, the anti-pastoral, basically, when you leave the city, the city is grungy, dirty, nasty, full of uh, characters who could knife you in the streets. Um, you go out into nature, and there's something there trying to kill you. So that's why it's anti-pastoral. And then you have, in many of the sto uh, pieces, you have deities who are a reflection of the characters if, say, the author chooses to uh, include deities within the piece itself, um, they are, again, they represent the characters to help represent the darkness of that world. Um, of course, the tone. The tone of a grim, dark piece is something that is uh, full of despair and hopelessness. So the characters may at some point have some, um, where they might achieve their goal, but then it's suddenly pulled away from them. Which then leads to the ending, which could be a tragic or ambiguous ending. All right. So, what is the what is a grim dark book? Well, the quintessential grim dark novel is Joe Abercrombie. I I think for I basically from one of my readings is that he is one of the first ones that is really represented a grim dark novel. All these other ones and many others were what led up to Joe Abercrombie. They're like dark fantasy. Now, um, actually, if you look at his Twitter tagline, he's actually called Lord Grimdark. Okay. Um, so we're going to take a look at a couple of characters within the piece here because there's a whole lot of point of views, and we don't have time to go through them all. So um, we're going to take an examine. Uh, one of the characters that uh, we see within the first law is uh, Giselle Dan Luther. Now, Giselle Dan Luther could follow a typical hero's journey. However, Abercrombie doesn't let him. Uh, what ends up happening is Sal has the, he's a noble born, so he has the uh, ability to go beyond. He is um, an amoral character because all he wants to do is a gamble and crowds with women. And in fact, um, when he's given the task to basically babysit his uh, one friend's sister, he basically impregnates her. Okay, that's the kind of guy he is. Um, in the world there where Giselle lives, there is a world on the brink of war. You have the Turkish army coming against the Union army, and it's something that is proceeding throughout the whole trilogy itself, until finally we have a big conflict. But before we can get there, uh, Dassel uh, has to prove himself, and so he has part of this contest where he has to defeat uh, people in sword fighting. Now, uh, what we see now is uh, Baez is a mentor type character, but when he comes into the scene there, he doesn't act like the mentor. So that's where another aspect of Grimdark breaks it. So what could potentially be someone to help Giselle gain that goal so that when he enters out beyond his ordinary world, uh, Christ actually uh, cheats for him. He uses a little bit of a spell to cast on uh, Giselle so that he defeats his enemy without actually achieving the defeat himself. So Giselle is basically, you know, he thinks he's the winner. Um, then Baez actually uses Giselle there to go off on a quest. He and a couple other people, the allies, they go off on a quest to find the seed to help defeat uh, Baez's uh, arch enemy. Uh, but along the way, the quest, we see there's a failure. And when they return, in fact, out in the, old, um, in the world, we see the anti-pastoral because they come across these creatures uh, that are like flatheads. And one of the first battles that he comes across, uh, he actually gets beat, beaten down, knocked out, and disfigured. So his jaw gets broken. He's got a huge scar. So in a typical hero, you would see that he would have been brave, prowess, go out there slaying the enemies. No, first time he comes across, he gets knocked down, ends up in a cart for most of the journey, there and back again. Um, 
In uh, this piece here, we really don't have the deities present. However, uh, Baez actually could represent the deity himself because he's a very powerful mage, and he got that way by overthrowing his mentor, his master. Um, what we find, once uh, Giselle returns back to the city, uh, Baez basically spreads rumors around saying that he was a champion, helped him out, and even though they came back defeated, he was still kind of uplifted. Now at the time there, we have a king whose son was murdered, and the king is sick. So when the king actually dies, uh, the council is trying to figure out who's going to be the next king. Well, then Baez pro uh, provides proof that Giselle is a bastard child of that king. When well, in actuality, he wasn't. So because we find that out later on, after all the battles and all this, like around like book three, so all this big development going on, we can see that the, uh, the tone is being, especially being developed for poor Giselle. Because not only can he not be with the girl that he loved, because she's lowborn, but he is forced to be a king and forced to marry some other woman from a lord who actually is not into men. In fact, she hates him. So we see that he is full of despair and hopelessness. But after the, the defeat of the army, he actually has a chance to uh, prove himself as a king and his right to establish himself when his mentor, Baez, who actually tells him he's nothing more than a puppet king. He's got to follow and do everything that Baez wants. And as a result, uh, he finds out the real truth of his birth. He is actually not noble born. He's just some child that was pulled off the streets, one of dozens who were uh, given over and potentially could have been in the role of the puppet king. So we can see here that Giselle faces a tragic ending to his uh, cause. In other words, he doesn't actually die in the series when it uh, fills out, uh, but there is a continuation, continuation on it. Um, and uh, he doesn't die, but he still the tragedy is that everything that he had, everything that he thought he had, he lost. So. Now, um, just to give an example, a quick outline from another series would be Mark Lawrence's Broken Empire. Again, this is a uh, completed trilogy, and this one is a quintessential uh, grim dark book. Here it comes from a point of uh, first person point of view of York, and um, just to give you quick highlights of him. Uh, York comes from his world at war. Basically, uh, people are fighting over this the, the throne to become emperors of this. Uh, become emperors of these uh, scattered kingdoms. And we have a lot of extreme light and violence in there because part of it, uh, again, Yorg is the guy, kind of guy that you wouldn't want to be friends with because it doesn't matter who's in the play, you're going to die. So basically, uh, one of his friends, um, when they're on this journey here, uh, they, they face a succubus, and one of his uh, allies is actually captured by the, uh, the succubus. They should basically put down the crossbow or else he's going to die. Well, rather than putting it down, he shoots his friend and kills him, and also knocks, uh, kills Succubus. So um, we see that moving on the series there, uh, there's not really much of the deities are present within this uh, novel here, uh, because it turns out that when Mark Lawrence was moving up, writing the rest of the books, that this was some sort of dystopian future, in a way, where after um, a nuclear strike destroyed our current um, Earth. Um, you can see that there is definitely uh, despair and hopelessness, especially when we get to the uh, third and last book of the trilogy, where he actually finds out that um, the, his brother and mother, who were murdered by their uncle, uh, were uh, the brother himself actually became the king of the dead and was coming in to try to uh, basically wipe out humanity. So just as he gets, attains the goal of becoming emperor, uh, he has a son with another woman previously, and so he kind of sacrifices himself. Although it seems like it's selfless, but in actuality, he's preserving his own son and preserving his future. So again, we see that he has a tragic ending. So and also the despair, like right when he has that, right when he's accomplished his goal, he loses it all. All right, and um, just to give you a couple more quick outlines. Yes, there are women that do. Right, Grim Dark. Anne Smith's Park is another one. Now, these are uh, trilogies or multi books that are not actually finished yet. So, although um, I'm going to put a disclaimer here, they uh, we don't have an ending, but I'm assuming that there will be an ending to them. In fact, her, her last book will be coming out next year. So, um, 
One thing that I really want to highlight in this book is, especially with like the anti-pastoral in here, uh, one of the things, we have characters walking in the desert. Now, I had an interview with Anna, and we're talking about the anti-pastoral. I said, yeah, your book is, it really captures that. She's like, no, no, no. I talk about the beauty of the desert. I talk about the landscape and all that. And I said, there's a dragon there ready to kill them. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, I don't care how beautiful it is. There's a dragon going to eat them. Um, so, again, <laughs> that's one of the things I really want to point out for this one. And then we come over to a series, again, uh, to focus on the deities aspects. Is they actually do this, uh, Michael uh, Fletcher for Beyond Redemption. He has a awesome, a unique world and that people themselves almost uh, shape their existence. And basically, the people who have the delusions make them into reality. And then that themselves, they're shaping the reality, thus acting as if they're gods. And in fact, there's this priest in this world who's raising a young boy up who is going to be this very powerful uh, godlike creature. Now, there's a rule in this one that the person that you kill on earth in the afterlife serves you. So he's raising this god up to, uh, to sacrifice so that the, and when he dies, uh, the god will serve him, the priest, overall, so he can be the most powerful person in the world. So obviously, you can tell that you know, the amorality is there. You can see that the heightened violence would be present. And again, we have a very dark tone within this world itself. Um, since we don't actually have an ending yet to the entire series, so I asked the author, he's like on book number five, I believe, and he said, that one's going to end it all. So I'm like, okay. So I'm hoping that we'll have some sort of grim dark ending because who knows? They can switch it up all suddenly and we could have a happy ending. And I'm like, oh, that'd be great. disappointing. <laughs> <laughs> now, um, how does this work? Now, we could take, uh, we could turn just about any story into a grim dark story. In fact, I'm going to give you an example from uh, Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. Are you thinking, how can Tolkien's Lord of the Rings be grim dark? I mean, he is the ultimate moralist. He's got the good versus evil. You know, you have the, the king who is facing down this evil lord to uh, save the land. Well, there's actually one character in Lord of the Rings that is quite grimdark, Boromir. See, Boromir is the son of the steward, Denethor, and Gondor. Now, we can see Gondor is at war with uh, the Sauron's orcs. Now, we can make it seem a heightened violence up there. We can put a lot of bloody guts in there to really get the violence amped up. And we, it's very anti-pastoral because, actually, we have the name, uh, Boromir himself is a, kind of an amoral character because when they find out about this ring, this powerful weapon, the, the enemy that they're going to talk about, they found, and they want to destroy it, uh, basically Boromir is like, um, no, I could use that to save my people. So he'd rather sacrifice all of Middle-earth there just to save his city. So we have this Amor character there. And when he goes out adventuring with the party, the, uh, the fellowship, of course, you have the anti-pastoral. They're being chased down by Urukai, who are trying to kill him. Okay, so in nature, you have things in nature are trying to, to slay them. Um, again, uh, we can don't have to stress so much about the deities because it doesn't need to be present. Um, again, we can see the tone. Uh, there's a point in which uh, Boromir tries to take the ring for himself when he isolates Frodo from the rest of the group. Now, you might say, think to yourself, all right, so uh, after Frodo escapes and Boromir is left there, he does sacrifice himself to allow the other hobbits to, uh, to, um, to try to escape anyway, uh, but even though he ends up dying in the process. That could be seen as almost a selfless act. Um, but what I found out, uh, when, when, when taken from a grim dark uh, version there, Boromir himself could actually uh, basically fall into despair and helplessness, which then would be the reason for why he allows himself uh, to fight the orcs rather than lose and be, go back and, or rather than win, and go back to his father to explain how he lost the ultimate weapon that could save his people. So he basically allows the um, Urukai to kill him. And so therefore we see that there is a tragic ending with poor Boromir. Now there are other elements there that are uh, very much very dark. I mean, you have a king who abandoned their people and rather than, uh, well, because he's 
bailing with the elves. And the only time he really goes back is we find out with Peter Jackson and all oh, that's because, you know, his girlfriend's going to die. So uh, he, in a way, is also a little bit grimdark because what he does is that he performs a little bit of necromancy. He goes back and raises the king of uh, the, Ar the army of the dead in order to go save the city. So, in a, so there's plenty of threads that we can choose from and twist them up and make them a little bit more <coughs> grim dark. So ultimately, what I found to be the um, definition that really suits grim dark is a subgenre of fantasy that is grim and full of despair. An anti-pastoral world at war with violent, amoral characters that end in tragedy or ambiguity. So, thank you. Any questions? Woo! That's really great. I've been looking forward to this, and this really tells me a lot about Green Dark. The question that's really sort of that I'm really strongly wondering about is that one of the sort of foundational ideas it seems of, of art or literature or drama is the ability of the audience or the reader to empathize with the protagonist and what they're going through and what they're, what they're struggling with. So if you have an amoral character who largely, by and large, fails, what do you think it is that attracts people to Grim Dark? And how, do you, how is the bond of the reader established? Well, um, we can tell, like, in our own world, we, can, uh, we have people who go through failure. So they can, sit, they can read these characters and say, OK, so yeah, they have this failure. Yeah, you eventually. Um, it, it kind of goes along the line that, yeah, in life sometimes we try to succeed, but ultimately we're going to die. Yeah. So it follows, it follows into that. And if people get tired yeah. of the, reading the same, oh, look it, we have this hero with this bright, shiny um, knight who's going to go out there and succeed. Yeah. We get tired of that. Yeah. But by and large, we're not amoral. No. We don't, we don't identify with amoral characters. We're scared of them. So in this way, asks you, it seems like this is a form that asks you to identify with yeah, I mean, ultimately, a lot of times, we sometimes make choices that benefit ourselves and not everybody else. True. So, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh? Uh, a wonderful job. Um, so, and maybe my question sort of related to Mickey's, but I'm thinking about how I consume literature, which is as an escape from the reality that I'm in. Like, you know, I go home and I want to go be a hero. I don't necessarily want to kill everyone. <laughs> so when you're when you're reading these books and you are identifying with the character, do you find yourself personally identifying with the worst character, or do you find yourself identifying with someone who's being victimized? Where where for your personal taste do you fall? Me, um, I like to see the journey. I like to see what's driving them forward. Uh, where is it that they're? Where is it that they have the hope built up? And where? What's going to cause that fall? I mean, we kind of like to see how some characters fall. I mean, think about Shakespeare. You have Richard III. We kind of like to see how he gains that power, and then we kind we do celebrate when he actually is defeated. So, yeah. 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 So it seems like a lot of this world is based on sort of the core, dark, rotten part of humanity. And you just kind of take that and then spread it over everything. Um, is this sort of a statement that the dark part of humanity is more powerful than what would be the moral or the pastoral or the peaceful? Or is this a statement that one sort of always is going to overrule the other? Well, I think it's more of a statement of saying that, yeah, not always do the people win. That sometimes that they lose. And that not always is the, you're going to have this beautiful garden, beautiful the Shire. In fact, we even see in Lord of the Rings there how the Shire is actually destroyed, <coughs> um, uh, basically turned into a place of machinery. So, and then, you, yeah, the people got to go back in there and save it itself. You know, the house got to go back and do that. But well, ultimately, what it comes down to is not about... Um, it's just the way of the world, sometimes, but not always. Is that uh, yeah, sort of, sort of getting there a little bit. At least I can see rule number five that the deities or the divine expressions of this world sort of uh, catch the what I see is actually a very human trait. I think a lot of this is sort of how mm -hmm. humanity would sort of spoil. Of these different aspects, either 
adding uh, uh, ambition, overly ambitious is what might cause war and sort of this anti-pastoral, which I see as more like an industrial landscape than a natural one. That's again, that's put, uh, applying a moralistic point of view to something that's more not moralistic. How so? Um, by saying that um, are we taking this beautiful world or changing it for good or bad? In this case, it's saying that evil is a matter of perspective. So what you think might you might be doing as evil, uh, what others might think that you're doing evil, you might see as doing something beneficial, for at least for yourself. But that was, that's exactly what an industrial is. Yeah, in a way, but again, uh, you can't apply that morality to it. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot. Yes. Wonderful job, sir. Woo! Woo! Good night, everybody. Go to the roof. Sometimes it's 7 and 8 p.m.